There are a lot of new battery factories being planned right now, all over the world. More than 30, only in Europe. But is there enough demand for all these factories? Are there enough raw materials? And to what extent will these batteries change our world? Before trying to answer these key questions for the future, I'll take you back to my own student days. When I was an engineering student in the early 90s, there were no solar jobs in Norway, hardly any in Europe. But the silicon solar cell and panel could be produced and was used a few places, and there were roadmaps for how they could be made cheap. I knew that if we were successful with developing solar power, the world could get access to an eternal energy source without emissions. No toxic materials, no rare materials, no noise. The main material used was silicon, the world's most abundant material. Some scenarios even said that although there were hardly any solar jobs in the 90s, there could be more jobs in solar than in oil and gas before I reached 50 years. Now, this has all happened. I passed 50 years, and solar energy is right now the cheapest energy wherever there is good sunshine, the cheapest energy source. And since people prefer sunny places, solar energy is in practice the cheapest energy source for the majority of people on the world. We Norwegians are born with the skis and snow and may struggle to understand this, but most people live south of here in sunny places. <laughs> and this uh, solar technology was developed with a tremendous speed. Japan and Germany created early stage markets, which drove ultra-fast technology development, partially also because this came out of the highly competitive electronics and semiconductor space. Myself, I was fortunate enough at that time to take part in starting and building a world-leading solar company, REC, which we developed all the way from zero to $2 billion revenue. We started 15 new manufacturing plants across the world, and we brought at least 10 new technologies to the market. And this solar technology has changed the energy market in a lot of countries. Now, in the middle of the day, cheap solar power is frequently dominating power supply in these solar sunny places. And as a consequence, the highest electricity price has moved from the middle of the day to the afternoon, after the sun has started to decline. But as we have all experienced the last two months, uh, only fossil and nuclear power plants can right now deliver guaranteed power day and night. So even though the world knows that fossil power plants contribute heavily to a worse climate, they continue to run all over the world. The ability of solar to replace these sources depends primarily on one factor, better and cheaper batteries. And one thing is very good and for sure, the sun rises every day. And when low-cost batteries come in place, this means one can rely on the sun to deliver not only power at daytime, but also power at daytime to batteries. This will give solar power all day, all night, at low cost in the sunny countries. Let's take India as an example. Here we see a typical profile of the electricity demand in India over a period of three days, with high demand at daytime and low demand at night. Without batteries, solar energy is foreseen to deliver up to 40% of their electricity need in 10, 15 years. But with medium cost batteries included in the system, solar energy will be stored to deliver also the afternoon need. But then with lower cost batteries, and not very low, reasonably low, market simulations show that solar and batteries will become the absolute dominant power source. Solar panels will deliver both the needs at daytime, and in addition, they will fill up the batteries. And at night, the batteries will deliver back. In this way, solar supply can go as high as 90% of the total electricity market in these market simulations for India. 80 to 90%. But the one key, is many low-cost batteries with good durability. Skeptics might say that the global production of renewables is just 4% of the world energy production, uh, so fossil fuels will anyway dominate for a long time. And true, if you read the statistics from the International Energy Agency, it's easy to get this impression. But these statistics are skewed. When a solar power plant, a coal power plant, and a nuclear power plant all produce the same amount of electricity, I'm sure you would all believe that these uh, contributions are counted as equal. But this is not true. 
the solar power plant will only be counted by one third of the others. One third, it's crazy. And here I must admit that whenever I hear any statements about skewed official statistics, I get very skeptical. But this one has an easy explanation, and it's easy to check and understand. It relates to the old and simplified method of how they tried to count primary energy from wind and sun, and at a time when they were anyway negligible. According to definition, primary energy is energy that has not been subject to any man-made conversion. For oil and coal, this is easy. They are counted when they are taken out from the ground. But when we start to use these fossil fuels, like in a car, about 70% is lost. Only 30% is used to actually drive uh, the car. The conversion of wind and solar energy to electricity has a very similar loss of 60 to 80%. But here we only count the electricity that's coming out, not the solar and wind energy that went in. This was, of course, wrong, but easier. The problem is that we are then counting only 30% of the energy, while for oil and coal, we count 100%. So no surprise that wind and sun look small and immature in all IEA statistics. So what happens if we correct for this error? We get a completely different picture. Now you see what's actually happening. Wind and solar are not many years away from taking the role as the leading energy source in the world. And with low-cost batteries, solar will end up as the dominant alone, due to the batteries, and because the sun rises every day. Let's now take a look at batteries and transportation. The second largest source of climate gas emissions after the power sector is the transport sector. And there are about one and a half billion vehicles in the world. And it's, of course, impossible to remove CO2 from the exhaust gas of so many devices. The only solution is the zero emission vehicle. And also here, the batteries will be really the key to changing the world. Again, as with solar technology 15 years ago, a tremendous amount of brain power and capital now goes into developing technology for electric batteries. The innovation speed is extreme. It's the same innovation culture that developed the cell phone, modern electronics, iPad, and the solar technology. And this time, it hasn't been Japan and Germany that provided the early stage market, but Norway. With our electric car politics, we have for several years created the world's largest market for electric cars. It's probably the most important climate policy decision Norway has ever made. Because selling more electric cars simply speeds up the development of the batteries by every week learning better how to make them, by attracting better talent, getting better suppliers, more competitive finance. So for every doubling of total sold volume, the batteries become cheaper, on average 15% cheaper per doubling of volume. And this means that the Norwegian policy on electric cars has contributed heavily to make these electric cars cheaper and better all over the world. I don't normally like to be proud of many things, but as a Norwegian, I'm a bit proud of this one. And I frequently hear abroad that Norway could do this because you're a rich country, but that's not the case. The main support here hasn't been subsidies to electric cars. It's been heavy taxation on the sale of polluting cars and of gasoline, and not on the sale of EVs. All countries can copy taxation. It just takes time to gradually grow the acceptance of such taxes. So what then about heavy trucks? A few years ago, most people would believe trucks and heavy trucks would need other solutions than batteries. But this situation is changing. Since the drivers anyway need to take a break every four hours of driving, the car only needs to be able to go maybe six hours. And now the leading heavy truck producers are converting their efforts to batteries as their main and very near-term zero emission solution. Again, these batteries will be changing a major activity in the world. So what then about the materials needed to make the batteries? Are there enough materials in the world? The simple answer is yes. There are major studies on this topic, and this is, or, this is of course part of the basis for the car industry's full dedication to electric cars. But you will also find many scientific papers claiming that there is a lack of battery materials. There's not enough. But these studies nearly always ignore that there are so many alternative battery chemistries that you can be, choose from and that the batteries are continuously improved. 
So the materials that are currently in use will take us very far, and should there become limitations, there are many to choose from. But be sure, there will be supply chain hiccups, and there will be price hikes in every fast-moving industry. And as a car purchaser, you will see this as a waiting line for the car. There will also be mines with environmental problems or poor labor conditions, unless the consumers or politicians or car makers make clear requirements. Recycling of battery materials will become important and is in rapid development. Here in Norway, we have at least two major industrial initiatives for new facilities that shall focus on recycling battery materials. But since cars need to have batteries that last, it will take time before there is much to recycle. But be sure, the vast majority of these batteries will be recycled. The key to all these changes are low cost, and there is an intensive competition to cut cost of batteries at the moment, and there are many opportunities. Cheaper material is number one, either by making them cheaper or better, or by replacing them with a cheaper alternative. But also the battery architecture itself can be changed, and greater automation and scale will help. So I hope you all agree that the future is bright for these batteries, and I truly believe they will change the world. But now let me invite you into our fantastic microcosmos of battery technology development. This is a mixture of uh, heaven and hell for a scientist. Inside these batteries, there are about 300 different chemical molecules in equilibrium with each other. If you modify any of them, there are 300 possible neighbors that may react with a negative surprise. I don't know your neighborhood, but getting 300 to stay in consensus is extremely difficult. Me and my team work on developing silicon nanoparticles together with some of the absolute best battery producers in the world. And this nanosilicon is so effective in storing lithium ions that they will make batteries both cheaper and smaller, so that the driving range of a car or truck can increase by up to 25%. If we should warrant performance for a year, these nanoparticles could be commercialized immediately. But the main challenge is to make them last for 10, 15 years. The reason silicon is difficult to use is that it can absorb so much lithium that it expands by more than 300%. At this series of pictures here, you can see what happens when a very small silicon particle is charged for the first time. It is first swelling on the outside, and then when the inside afterwards starts to swell, it cracks. And this is already during the first charging. So, and there are many more problems related to having these survive. It's a truly challenging scientific and engineering problem. When we start to get closer to the goal, we have developed some extremely small nylon particles as the basis. These newly particles are softer than normal, and they are so small that to understand how small they are, you need to sort of cut a hair a thousand times along the hair, and then you have to flip the hair and cut a thousand times again. Then you are at our size. And on these surfaces, we even need to put even thinner coatings. For any battery producer to approve such a material for use in millions of cars, uh, we, can only, we can not only work with invisible nano stuff. We need to demonstrate that we can make it at scale. And this we are demonstrating now with a reactor that can make about 100 tons per year. 100 tons of a particle that you cannot even see one by one. In parallel to our work on silicon nanodes, there are also collaborating teams, and there are competing teams, and there are teams on all components that can lead to lower costs and better batteries. Teams who will win, teams who will lose. In some, these teams are creating 10,000 inventions that are deemed good enough to pay for a patent application, indicative of maybe 30 to 50,000 employees in research. All this work, all our work, all you buyers of electric cars and the politicians stimulating demand, all the people investing in battery manufacturing and battery materials. We are in practice working together to make sure that batteries will dramatically lower emission in the two largest emitting sectors of the world, power production and transportation. These batteries will change the world. Thank you. <laughs>